if we look at the long term global trends, I think this is important just when we, we deal with uh, looking at uh, before we get into the SA market, because all of these are going to have a big impact on SA. So first of all, decarbonization, uh, something that has definitely you know, grown uh, massively uh, in focus and, and driven by, partly by COVID. The world has dealt with a global crisis, which required a global response. Um, another big crisis out there is decarbonization. You've seen you know, Democrats come in um, that's, and, and change the Trump outlook, uh, rejoining the world, and as a result, uh, you know, this trend for decarbonization um, is very strong and, and that's going to have an impact. You know, the fact that South Africa produces the majority of its energy uh, through coal uh, is, is going to impact on exports to the rest of the world. Uh, there are positives, though, from, you know, some of the commodities which are potentially going to benefit from that. Digitization, um, you know, it was already a well-established trend um, and, and we know that, you know, lockdown has, has driven that you know, five years into the future. And, and you're just going to continue to see the gap between those countries that can adopt digitization and those that can't, um, and those businesses that embrace digitization um, significantly across their business and those that don't. And then uh, increasing inequality and, and, and something, you know, that's, that's obviously very topical in South Africa at the moment, but globally as well, because, you know, the, the changes that have been driven through the world are, are increasing inequality you know, if you look around the world uh, between the skilled sectors and skilled industries, which have continued operating and thrived under a COVID world, um, and a lot of the less skilled industries, which typically have, have struggled and suffered. So some, some profound changes happening around the world um, and having implications for, for the South African market. If you look, obviously, and I mean, you, you mentioned those numbers, obviously, of, of the very low lows post uh, the lockdown, We've had quite a strong, you know, bounce back in our markets. Um, but if you look at the SA macro environment, um, you know, that, that doesn't look as positive. Obviously, we've had a very steep recession. Uh, the economy was managing to bounce back quite sharply. Um, and, and then you had the kind of further negative of the unrest in, in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng, which has definitely dented that recovery and some of the optimism that we had seen creeping back in. Um, we have seen and you know, in SA, as, as always, it's always a matter of two steps forward and two steps backward. We've seen some very, you know, encouraging announcements on, you know, uh, private power generation, uh, lifting the cap to 100 megawatts, uh, government finally cutting the kind of purse strings to, to some of the SOEs. You know, those are encouraging steps and it's certainly some that we would not have seen take place uh, under previous governments. Um, but we still sit in a very, very tough, tight fiscal situation. Uh, which remains a concern, um, particularly, again, when you're looking at economic growth and how well this economy can grow. Obviously, if, if you've got austerity coming through from government, that is going to be a cap on, on economic growth, on consumption, um, and certainly not if you, don't, if you don't have a very strong kind of boost from the private sector at the same time. And the reality is we, knew, we need strong economic growth. In order to close those inequality gaps, we need much stronger growth. Um, and in order to get ourselves in a more sustainable debt position, we need you know, a faster growing economy in order to support the tax collection um, and, and balance kind of the, the renewed austerity from government with, with better revenue coming in. What has certainly helped um, has been you know, low interest rates, and, and we do think that low interest rates are, are here to stay. Inflation, certainly in South Africa, going against the trend of the rest of the world, and actually, you know, remaining quite low and, and, and providing that missing piece and in, enabling the SARP to keep uh, the environment quite uh, conducive to growth. So just this chart is very instructive. So this is just, so, I mean, that's the macro situation, which is not particularly great, but for us, it's always about valuation. Um, and if you look at this chart, this measures our upside to fair value of the, of the JSE. So what we think the fair value of the JSE is compared to where it's trading. You'll see today we're sitting at virtually as high as it's ever been, um, you know, in terms of potential return. So yes, you can see this little, the, you know, back in uh, March 2020 when the market crashed, got to slightly higher. Um, but despite that, we still see significant return opportunities for overall market. And if you break that down between um, kind of SA facing businesses, 
um, and, and global businesses. You'll see equally across there. So these are like your pure domestic SA businesses where we see you know, close to around 60% upside. And these are the global businesses listed on the JSC also coming through with numbers close to around 60%. So despite the fact that you know, the economic outlook is, is certainly still quite cloudy, uh, the valuations, the implicit values of businesses on the JSC, so we still believe offers significant upside return potential. Um, so, I mean, the RAND, you know, has, has recovered quite strongly um, and, and that's obviously benefited, uh, you know, a lot of, of the domestic businesses on, on a forward-looking basis. So, when we look at the JSC, you understand the JSC is made up, you know, it used to be a domestic market, but today, if you look at it, it's made up of what we put it in, in three buckets, basically, which is resources, um, roughly around a third. Uh, you've got a whole lot of global stocks, which happen to be listed on the, on the JSE, things like a British American tobacco, the Naspers, et cetera. And then your pure domestic businesses, and where they're the large market cap businesses, one or two industrials, uh, the banks, um, and, and some of the savings businesses. Um, and if you look across all of those buckets, actually we see good upside on those stocks. And I'll take you through some of those, but resources, you know, we continue to see uh, strong demand uh, for commodities and we think the prices on the sector, the valuations are still attractive. The global businesses, while globally we think global markets are expensive, we wouldn't be allocating money to uh, develop markets globally. In fact, we've been reducing our global exposure in our multi-asset funds. We do think some of those global shares that are listed on the JSE, like a BTI, like a Naspers, a Quilter, a Bitcorp, etc., those shares actually we think are quite cheap at the moment and as a result also uh, offer good upside. And then the domestic companies, you know, despite the fact that we've had a very, very tough economy um, and obviously the COVID lockdown, we've been amazed at just how well domestic businesses have managed themselves through the crisis. We've seen them defend top line better than we'd expected, and we've seen them manage their costs far better than, than we hoped that they could do, given that they'd already come through many lean years. Um, and as a result, we've seen them, you know, in terms of the reporting over the last 12 months, come out with far better numbers uh, than we would have expected uh, 12 to 18 months ago as we went into the lockdown. So resources, you know, we don't see this as a specific super cycle, um, but we do see there's still very strong demand for a couple of key commodities, uh, especially those commodities facing the new energy world that we're moving into. We spoke about decarbonization, um, you know, and that is going to be very bullish for your new metals like copper, cobalt, nickel, which are all going into EVs and, and the new various uh, forms of, of, power gener of power generation. Um, interestingly enough, even though we don't see growing demand for things like the old world commodities like coal, we are still very bullish on the pricing environment, given the fact that, you know, the big strong shift away from that in terms of supply uh, and the fact that there's still significant demand for those commodities mean that those prices are going to remain, uh, you know, uh, higher for longer. And what's key in this cycle compared to previous cycles has been significantly less capital investment by the, the mining companies. If you look at this chart, if you look back 2013, 2015, you'll see the companies were spending significantly on CapEx and they were doing a lot of that with debt. They ended up with very tough balance sheets. The moment, uh, you know, prices started to come off, uh, the whole world got very concerned around the sustainability of their balance sheets and you saw the likes of Billet and Anglos, Glencore, all under massive pressure. Today, you know, there's been far greater because of that far greater uh, cost and capital discipline. And as a result, the companies have all de-geared um, and they haven't invested heavily in new capacity, which is a further support for prices staying higher for longer. So we think the resource sector of the JSC, you know, still offers significant upside from these levels. They're paying back very strong, uh, you know, their, their strong cash flows. Instead of building new mines, they're returning that cash to shareholders. We've seen very strong dividends, we've seen big special dividends, and we've seen buybacks. Um, and when we put in normal prices for commodities um, below the majority of those below where they're trading today, we still see these trading on single digit PE multiples. Um, and you know, we do think that there is still strong demand um, coming from you know the new energy story, as well as 
uh, you know, the massive um, infrastructure uh, rollout that you're seeing, not just in China nowadays, but also, you know, in the US, uh, having, you know, signed off on their $3 trillion, uh, you know, um, commodity or infrastructure rollout. So resources, you know, we continue to think uh, looks attractive. This is just your forward multiples, one year forward. Um, and you can see, you know, these stocks, they, they're already discounting significantly lower prices if you look at these multiples. And then if you look at the dividend yields, you can see that they're actually returning their cash back to shareholders. Something as extreme as an army black, where, where we are a significant shareholder, you know, will return the market cap of the business in four years uh, at the current payout ratio. And then on the domestics, as we said, you know, those results have come out far better than, than we would have expected. Um, they've managed to defend their top lines um, and then good cost control. You know, a classic line from so many management teams has been, you know, fixed costs ultimately have become variable. When you enter into a, a crisis as significant as we've seen with the lockdown, you've seen them actually readdress cost bases, costs that, that they would have previously considered to be fixed, they've been able to reduce. Uh, and an obvious one today is are things like uh, property, you know, uh, given the work from home trend, uh, you know, the massive reduction in, in space is, is a key area which, you know, was previously considered fixed, but over time, now companies are managing to, to pull that uh, pull that out of, of their cost lines. We are not going gangbusters into domestic businesses. We are not going massively overweight because we are still concerned about some lagged effects coming through. Uh, things like the impact of retrenchments. Um, you know, ultimately, if you are being great on cost control, those costs are someone else's top line or someone else's salaries. Um, you know, the, this constant kind of desire to roll this kind of additional grant support, you know, at some point in time, uh, that is going to be unsustainable. Um, and when that support gets kicked out, uh, you know, how, how sustainable are some of the top lines. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the banks have really come through um, with far better results than we would have expected. We expected them to normalize back to 2019 earnings levels in 23. We now expect that to happen in, in 2022. Um, you know, and despite that, you know, uh, banks like NetBank and Standard Bank still trading on, you know, mid to high single digit PE multiples, attractive dividend yields, and uh, the, the savings industry uh, with equity markets having done what they've done, uh, that's a very strong support to the savings industry. So, uh, you know, our big exposures to momentum, but we're in Sunlum, we're in 91 as well, uh, with market levels at the levels that they're at. That's a very strong support for the earnings base of these companies. And, you know, while they have had to pick up the tab for uh, increased mortality uh, from the COVID crisis, once that's through, we do see, you know, still strong cash generating ability. And then, you know, we've uh, done recently just uh, taken a, a big stake in this game, uh, that business we expect to continue growing quite strongly. Um, the hospitality industry, one that's obviously been uh, hit very hard, but you can buy the assets today, uh, you know, at probably a third of the cost of, of building those assets. Um, and as we start to get uh, the vaccine rollout, as economies start to open up, you know, we see the earnings power of, of those industries returning. So, you know, again, if you, you know, if you're looking at the markets up strongly off the low base, you're ignoring the fact that, you know, clearly the market went down massively at that point in time. And there's a lot of industries and there's a lot of businesses out there that still haven't got back to their kind of pre-COVID earnings level. And we expect as more and more of them start to report and more of them so show that they're actually going to be getting back to that pre-COVID earnings level, um, you're going to see, you know, the, the stock prices continue to follow on. Just taking a snapshot of, of what the, the top 10 holdings of, of the top 20 fund look like, you know, th this is the point, you know, we like to make. It's the, the ratings on these companies are still uh, exceptionally low and if you look at the dividend yields uh, particularly in an environment like South Africa where today cash is getting you three three and a half percent um, and to my previous comments around the SAR uh, being able to maintain very easy monetary policy for the time being uh, we don't see the interest rates kicking up in which case you're really achieving significantly better returns from an equity portfolio just on dividend yields 
than you would from your cash or cash plus portfolio, which we think is going to continue. Well, you know, when once that recognition starts to come through, um, you know, we see further rating um, poten re rating potential. And maybe, you know, one of the other points, um, you know, that, that I don't think has been spoken about enough is the increasing corporate activity. So in the space of the last 12 months, you've seen a number of South African companies getting taken out uh, from November last year, where Afrox was bought out by Lindy, uh, to, you know, in the Imperial Logistics Group being bought by DP World, uh, you know, Distel currently involved in discussions with Heineken. Increasingly, you are seeing uh, you know, these transactions take place. Ultron, uh, which was a big holding of ours last year, unbundling its uh, UK uh, tech business bites uh, and getting a huge value unlock. And, you know, there is still, I think what that indicates is there is still significant value uh, on the JSE. A lot of these shares, uh, you know, we, we don't think the market's giving them the recognition um, of, of the underlying earnings power in which case, you know, you are going to see more corporate activity uh, because, you know, that situation just won't, you know, ultimately something will come along, either the shares will re-rate or someone else will come along and, and do that for you. And we think that's also a very strong underpin for argument of there still being good return opportunities um, on the JSC. And, you know, this just giving you a flavor for what we think the total upside return is. So I've gone through quite a bit quite quickly. I know we're on quite a time constraint, uh, but yeah, Trevor, uh, happy to take any questions. Neville, thanks for that. And yeah, we've got time for, I think, just one quick question. Uh, appreciate you keeping, keeping to the time there. Um, just, you've commented a lot, obviously, on the South African market here and the South African stocks. And certainly, I think you've made the case that there seems to be some good upside uh, potential with them still. One of the big areas that's currently under focus is the U.S. and the U.S. Fed. And with them now making noises that they're going to stop their bond buying uh, and start, you know, interest rates eventually to start rising, it's, it's still up for debate when exactly they may do their first interest rate hike, and it's certainly not going to be something very quick and, and large. But we have seen, for example, the U.S. dollar strengthen on the back of that and perhaps a little bit of market nerves of possible rising interest rates. How, when this whole scenario does play out, sometime probably in the next 6 to 12 months, how do you see that potentially impacting the South African equity market yeah. or, or some of these domestic stocks and, and really the story, I guess, that you've painted? Yeah, so look, at, I think it ultimately depends on the pace and, and the level of, of how quickly they normalize. And they, you know, and certainly our view is that it's not going to be particularly fast and not going to be particularly aggressive. So, you know, I do find it amusing that the world's concentrating on interest rate hikes, you know, when you're already at close to zero in the US and, and you know, they're only talking about moving up from, you know, zero to maybe getting to 1%. So, you know, while, you know, clearly the US printing of money, uh, both at the Fed as well as, you know, the QE, that that's taken place in the low interest rates has been beneficial for all risk assets around the world. You know, South African market hasn't benefited at all from that. If you look at the statistics out there, you'll see that foreigners remain net sellers of SA. Uh, so, you know, we have not kind of benefited from the global largesse um, that, that's come out of US and European money printing. Uh, and that's, you know, for all those SA idiosyncratic reasons. You know, the fact that uh, the markets lost faith in the SA government, the market lost faith in the SA fiscus. And despite, you know, some of those kind of steps that I alluded to earlier, we haven't seen foreign money come back uh, into, into the market. So to the extent that you see a normalization of interest rates in the US and some of the money that went hunting offshore for better returns starting to return, I think you would see very little impact on the SA market predominantly because very little of that money is here. I think we still are positioned in, in a contra position where, you know, if we can get something right, if we can 
benefit from the kind of windfall tax gains and, and reduce our deficit uh, instead of spend it in, in other pockets. Um, you can change the narrative out there that we're heading towards a debt trap, in which case you can actually start to see money come and into the SA market where, you know, globally we sit on the highest real yields you can get. Um, and even with interest rates in the US moving up, uh, you know, with inflation running at four or 5%, their, you know, their real yields are still deep, deep in the negative, uh, whereas ours are still four or 5% positive. Um, and if you see, you know, some kind of uh, economic policy reform, which starts to get people slightly more optimistic around economic growth faster than a 2% real, uh, you can see money coming back into the equity market. So, you know, I think very little risk of money leaving the markets on a more normalized um, and still an opportunity for us to attract funds, uh, just given how cheap the, the markets are. Thanks, Neville. Um, and yeah, lots of food for thought. And, and I think, yes, we probably on a similar page in, in terms of that. And certainly within our multi-manager funds, domestic funds, we have been increasing our domestic equity exposure over the last six months or so.